No One Questioned My Childhood Town's Ice Cream Man Written by Repulsive Answer 933 When I was little, the sound of an approaching ice cream truck was one of the best. The chimes were beautiful, and whether it was Mr. Softy or Jack and Jill, in seconds of hearing even the faintest sound of the truck's tunes, I'd be out on the street, wildly craning my neck to hear what direction it was coming from. I swear, the ice cream tasted best in the days where it seemed your flip-flops would melt to the ground. Those awful, sweltering days could be turned around by just a quick swap of money and dairy. It was one of those days when we first saw the truck special to our neighborhood. The moment I heard its faraway chimes, I ran as fast as I could on the sidewalk. I could slowly see my friends spilling out of their homes, and we all held our breaths as the truck approached our street. We waited for what seemed like an eternity, as the melody slowly grew louder and louder, as if it were the thunder before a storm. When it finally appeared, we all stared at it quizzically for a moment, before rushing towards it and forming a line. The truck was new and strange to us, and almost looked like one that would be found in a cartoon, almost an exaggeration of what an ice cream truck should look like. Its base color was a drab white, but it was covered in red stripes and adorned on all sides by small red hearts. The logo proudly announced it as the Sweetheart. Sitting proudly on top was a large plastic ice cream cone, with three scoops of brown, white, and pink, and a fat plastic cherry on top. I'd never seen the brand before, and having done research since, I can find no evidence of it ever existing outside of my childhood memories. I struggled and pushed my way towards the front of the line, and once the vehicle was stopped, I was in the position to be the first customer. As I examined the still closed window on the side of the truck, I noticed that none of the items on the list were branded. No Spongebob or Spider-Man popsicles. No drumsticks. But still, that wasn't odd, and at the time I remember assuming it was a local family that ran it. When the man that drove the truck opened the window, sweat was already streaking down my face, even though I'd only been outside for a few minutes at most. He was tall and lanky, and when he rested his arms on the shelf protruding from the window, they seemed to get in the way of the rest of his body. He looked somewhere in between 16 and 40, because although his face was spotted with acne, his hair, which was dyed almost completely a dark purple, was graying at the roots. His face itself, besides the acne, was contorted into what looked like an almost painful smile, as if his cheeks had been taped to his ears, and I could see each of his perfectly white teeth sticking out of his bright red gums. His eyes, although bloodshot and intense, had little to no other emotions behind them. But the thing I hated the most about him was his skin. His body was encased in what looked like almost transparent flesh. His milky white outside had turned an awful pink by the almost exposed muscles and veins lying just below the surface. As he moved, I swear I could see each muscle ripple see his blood flowing, and see his joints move as he bent his elbow. Then, after a long while of me just staring at him, he asked me for my order. After I'd collected myself, and had been yelled at for holding up the line by the people behind me, I gave it to him. All I wanted was a twist ice cream cone dipped in a cherry coating. I know I didn't ask for sprinkles, but when I got my order, it was coated in small red dots in the shapes of hearts, and I couldn't help but think it looked an awful lot like the man's acne-covered face. And as I watched the others get their confections, it appeared the heart-shaped sprinkles came with each order, as if it were a requirement for whatever brand had leased the truck. As the others ordered and ate their treats, I watched the ice cream man stare at each customer intently, 
never once breaking eye contact. I noticed that while watching him that he didn't blink the entire time I could see him, as his eyelids looked similar to his cheeks, as if they'd been stapled to his forehead. After he had driven away, I asked my friends if they'd ever seen his truck or him before. We all collectively agreed we hadn't, and I could tell they didn't really think much about it. But there was something about the nonchalance with which they treated his terrible face that unnerved me deeply. It was a few more weeks before we saw him again. It was another one of those awfully hot days, and our sweat didn't have time to soak into the pavement before it sizzled and evaporated. We were about to call it a day, having spent the whole afternoon outside already, when he appeared on our street. There was no warning, no notification, it just appeared. I don't even think he was playing the music until he approached our corner. When the truck had ground to a halt, I was once again the first in line. He seemed sickly, and even with the freezing temperatures inside the truck, I could see that his sweat was beginning to seep into his shirt and stain it. My order, though correct, was once again covered in tiny heart sprinkles, and I ate it until my tooth hit something soft and rubbery in the middle of one of my scoops. I stuck my sweaty fingers into the cool ice cream and pulled out an odd peach scrap of something. As I turned it around in my hand, I noticed what it was. Held in my sticky, dairy-coated hands was a scrap of scalp, and hanging off of it was a lock of hair. I dropped my food and screamed, alerting all of the customers. Everyone except the ice cream man turned their head to look at me as he kept staring at the now-turned head of the person at the front of the line. As the adults around me inspected the scrap of skin to see if it was real, I saw the ice cream man slam the window at lightning fast speeds, crushing the person at the front of the line's fingers. The customer recoiled in pain, and before the adults could realize something was wrong, the truck simply turned off its music and sped away before anyone could react to stop it. We called the police, but no one had seen him, and it was as if he and the vehicle had dissolved into nothing as soon as they were out of sight. After some digging, the cops could find no evidence of the truck in its records, and there was absolutely no proof that his truck, or a truck like it, had ever been seen anywhere before. The only thing we knew for sure was who the piece of scalp belonged to. Daisy Sims was a six-year-old that had gone missing on the hottest day in the summer so far, and as she was last seen in the local park, it was assumed she'd gotten lost in the woods. No one knew why her skin had been in my ice cream, but we all assumed that on that awfully hot day, she'd had a run-in with the thing that drove the ice cream truck. After that awful day, we weren't allowed outside without an adult, but at that point the heat had become so unbearable that no one wanted to go outside anyway. Sometimes while drifting off to sleep, restless from the warmth that permeated through our air conditioning, I could hear the faintest sound of the truck's music. It was soft and quiet but one night, and would phase in and out of even being audible. The few times I left the house to talk to my friends, I asked them if they would hear it too. They just looked at me like I was crazy, and soon I began to think I was, as each night the truck's music grew louder, until one night I couldn't sleep at all. The music felt as if it was right outside, blaring, seeming to call to me, or any child still awake at this hour. I knew not to go out, but curiosity got the best of me, and I threw open my bedroom window that faced the street and looked out at the truck. Its window was open, but all I could see inside 
was the darkness of the truck. No waiting ice cream man. No one, no thing. Then, I saw a door across the street open. Under the cover of darkness, a rogue, greedy kid that I recognized as being in the grade below me scuttled out of his home and made his way to the truck, guided by its blaring music. He rushed to the side of the truck with the window and waited for a moment before jumping up and knocking. As soon as his chubby fist hit the window, it swung open, and out from the darkness poured the ice cream man. He looked as bad as I'd seen him yet. His skin was nearly transparent at this point, and his visible muscles appeared almost the same dark purple color his hair was. The thing I couldn't help but notice was that he was drooling. Thick, white cords of saliva that dripped down the window ledge and then trailed off onto the ground. He stared at the child as if in a trance before asking him for his order, and when given it, he melted back into the darkness of the truck. He reappeared holding the kid's goods, and although I couldn't hear exactly what was said, I got the impression that the food was free. As soon as the kid had begun to eat his ice cream, something silently slunk out of the truck's window, what appeared to be a long pincer or tentacle of some sort, and moved around before settling on a tree on my front lawn and wrapped itself around it. Others followed, similarly wrapping their many jointed limbs around mailboxes and print doors and patio chairs. Soon it almost looked like the web of a spider, the multiple limbs and tentacles acting as each thread in a web, as if some giant invisible spider were weaving a net around the oblivious, feasting child. Eventually, something that looked like an extraordinarily elongated arm reached out from behind the ice cream man who'd been standing there watching the limbs weave themselves around the kid. The arm rushed past every other string of flesh and made a path towards the kid, still eating his ice cream and still blind to the things happening around him. I watched as the arm finally reached him and scuttled up his body. It wrapped around him again and again, muffling his screams of terror, slowly ripping the air from his lungs. Once he'd passed out or fully suffocated, as I didn't know and I was too paralyzed with fear to go outside and find out, each arm that was part of the web began to detach and grab hold of the child's body. The arms grabbed and scratched at the poor kid, slowly tearing him apart piece by piece. An arm grabbed a lock of hair, a finger, a tooth, anything they could. They pulled until it was no longer a part of the child who was too hungry for his own good. Once there was nothing remaining of the poor soul except for a scrap of t-shirt here and there, the arms began to recede into the darkness of the inside of the truck with their prizes. And I swear, in the faint light that shone into the truck's window, I swear I could see the hands put the scraps of child into the different pints of ice cream. And as the music coming from deep inside the truck began again, right as the truck pulled away, I swear I saw someone's, no, some things, hand reach out and wave goodbye, as if it had been able to see me the whole time. The next morning, I woke to police sirens coming from across my street. As I crept out of my house to try to eavesdrop, I almost knocked something off my front steps. It was a small twist ice cream cone, dipped in a cherry coating, adorned with small red sprinkles. I don't remember hearing about any other missing kids after that, and I certainly never saw him again. In the decade or two that have passed since it all happened, I've grown 
and believed I'd forgotten about it. That was until a call from my mother about a large amount of children going missing in my hometown unearthed these memories and led to endless sleepless nights of research. So far, I've found no proof that anything I saw really happened. And all I know is that the child I saw get torn apart had still never been found, and the truck proudly titled The Sweetheart has no documentation proving that it ever existed. I think I might be going insane, as during the last few nights of useless combing through papers decades old, I've been hearing a familiar sound. And as I sit here now, trying my hardest to put my faulty memories into words, I can hear it. Slowly rising out of the darkness of night, I can hear the faint chimes of an ice cream truck. Okay. Well, thank you all for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's video. If you did, I would really appreciate it if you would give it a like, subscribe to the channel, or follow the podcast for more. And uh, if you really enjoyed it, share it with a friend who you think might like it. Huge thanks to the author for letting me narrate their story on this episode. And if you'd like to support the channel, there are a couple ways you can do so. You can always pick up a t-shirt, hoodie, sticker, mask even over at teespring.com slash store slash Clancy Pasta store. That always helps us out. Or if you'd like to send in a tip, you can always go to patreon.com slash Clancy Pasta or uh, join the membership option here on YouTube. You can follow me on Twitter at Clancy Pasta, same at Clancy Pasta on Instagram as well. And uh, also, I just recently started just kind of like a fun side, just hobby Twitch channel. So I think I'll throw a link to that in the description as well. You can follow there and then get notified when I go live and uh, stuff like that. Fun all around. Let me know in the comments what you would like to see in the future. And without further ado, I hope you all have a great night and uh, don't have any nightmares. All right, thanks for listening, everybody. Cheers.